This is PBS. About Your House with Bob Yap was partially underwritten by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. In past places and future spaces, from main streets to back roads, we're helping Americans bring preservation home. The National Trust for Historic Preservation. Welcome to today's show, and today's show is called About Your Floor. Yeah, I know. We're going to talk about floors. You know, there are a lot of really neat flooring materials you can use in your old house, and we're going to talk about the most popular ones. My favorite, and probably one of the most popular that there is, is refinishing wood floors. Now, there are two ways to do wood floors. One is what we call aggressive floor sanding, and the other one is passive floor sanding. And we're going to take a look at aggressive right now. Uh, Dave, my floor refinisher, is in here. He's doing a little puttying on the floor right now. And it looks like he, what he's done here is he's taken his first pass on most of the floor, and then he's getting the floor filled up over there. Uh, takes four passes on this floor because it was so gummy. And uh, sometimes like, you can do it with three to get the floor ready to put the finish on. Then there are three coats of finish. It's a polyurethane-based finish. Now, stay away from the high-gloss finishes because when people walk in your house, they're going to see a glossy floor instead of seeing the wood grain, and you don't want them to do that. A satin finish is what Dave's going to be using here, and that gives the wood a chance to show itself. Now, there are two things that you need to remember in pricing. The first one is, is that wood flooring costs less than carpeting, and the second one is that carpeting costs more than wood flooring. It costs between $1.50 and $2.50, depending where you are in the country, a square foot to refinish a wood floor. Now, carpeting will run $18 to $30 for anything decent per square yard. So you can see if you do the math a little bit that actually refinishing wood floors is cheaper. Now, look at this machine over here. You can see this thing is really aggressive looking, and it really does. It's the thing that gets all the old finish off and gets it so that it's ready to put the finish on. And I really like this machine, and I think Dave's gonna let me do the first pass here. Uh, I don't think so, Dave. Dave, come on, let me do it, all right? Uh, get your own machine, Bob. Now, come on, let me start this uh, thing. Uh, uh, no, 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 all right, all right. We're gonna let Dave do it. We're gonna let him do it himself. Go ahead, Dave, show us what a macho guy you really are. Here he goes. Start that baby up. <laughs> Another critical part of sanding a floor is the edge sanding. Now this is an edge sanding machine. I like this machine too. And it gets right up to the baseboard without messing it up. Does a nice job. Well, the other alternative to aggressive floor sanding is passive, like I mentioned before. Now think of your floor like an antique piece of furniture, something really valuable that has lots of character marks and dents and the corners kind of shaved off. Would you take a belt sander and grind it all out? Well, you wouldn't because that would ruin the value of the antique. Well, think of your floor that way. It has character marks where people have walked through and made a rut in the floor a little bit or where a piano was or maybe some guy had a really big chair in front of the fireplace. Those are all the history and the character of your house. Now, what Phil's doing is he's wiping off the excess of a non-toxic, non-flammable stripper. He's still wearing the eye protection and the gloves and we have good ventilation, but it's really, really an easy product to use and it comes in a little thing like this. Now, the other things that you need, of course, you need some rags because you're gonna be wiping things up. And your first line of defense is to use one of these green scouring pads. You can use that to wipe up the excess after you've got it off big time with the rags and the putty knife. Then you can wipe it off. We're going to use this floor buffer right here with a screen, a sanding screen. It's 100 grit, so it's pretty fine. It's not going to take the floor material off, but it's going to help take the finish off. And that's what we're after. Now, I'm going to get back here and see if I can get this big machine to do this. Now, this is a brand new screen, so sometimes the machines get a little wild on you when you first start out. Now, let's see. We put it over here. This is going to cost you about $25 a day to rent. It's really not too bad. Now, let me get myself going here. All right, let's see what we got. All right, here we go. All right, looks like we got most of the finish off of it. 
and the parquet that's underneath all that dirt and grime is showing up beautifully. We do have one little problem right here. You see a big black stain and there's a couple of them elsewhere. I tell you what, what happened here was that we had a wall somebody had added in and the nails probably rusted from leaky pipes or what have you and it stained the floor. We'll probably have to do a couple more coats on this area, but you can probably get by with one coat. Now the next step to all of this is these gaps in the floor down here and there's a whole bunch of them between a lot of the floorboards. That stripper down in there, now remember that's a non-flammable stripper, so you can use a wet dry vac to suck that out and that'll get all that stuff out of the gaps, that's important. Then whatever your stripper company recommends as a neutralizing agent, some sort of either water, or alcohol, whatever they say to use, use it. Just make sure you have good ventilation in here and that you're wearing eye protection and gloves when you're working with it like Phil was earlier. That's real important. Now, let's take a minute and go look at a floor that's completely finished that we passively did. And here's an example of what it's going to look like when it's done. That border is going to look just like this. It's in the same historic house. It's being renovated and it was passively restored just like what we were looking at. And it has great wood. Look at this white oak. It has vermilion or what we call paduke wood, maple. It even has some rosewood. It's great stuff. But if you sanded it aggressively, it would really ruin it. That's really important to remember. And it's really a matter of taste. If you want the character marks in your floor, go ahead and do the passive refinishing. That's, that's the way to go. If you want it to look brand new and you have thick oak or thick maple, go ahead and aggressively sand it. That's not really a big problem. Let's take a minute, though, and go look at what the finished product of some floors that were aggressively sanded look like. Although I prefer passive refinishing of floors, sometimes aggressive is the only way to go. Now, these pine floors are original to this 1870s house, and they turned out pretty well. Now, the fur floors that you're looking at in the dining room, that's an addition from 1903, and they sanded up and refinished aggressively, and they, it, they did a nice job on that as well. Now, I like these pine floors because they have that old look. The problem was, just like the dining room floors, they were covered with layers and layers of glue and carpeting, so they really had to be aggressively sanded. Now, this kitchen floor is bird's eye maple. It came out of an old church that was torn down around 1900, and it wasn't on its surface as bad, but the fact was it was a gymnasium floor and was beat up pretty badly, so we ended up having to aggressively sand that. These wide pine floors actually turned out to look more like something out of George Washington's house. I like the look. I'm constantly amazed at all the wonderful different variations for different types of flooring material there are out there in America today. You know what? Ceramic tile is one of my favorite. It's just a beautiful substance and the variations are really endless. Now, when it comes to ceramic tile, sometimes you can go to your full service lumber yard or you can go to the tile outlet stores and you can get tile there that's more affordable maybe for what you're doing. But in this shop, you're talking the moderate all the way up to the high end. So there's some choices and you can use these tiles that you're seeing to accent some of the less expensive ones if that's what you want to do. Now here's a really fun piece. Looks like a tile but it's a piece of concrete. It has copper inlaid into a nice design and then the concrete's been dyed. It's a very interesting piece, I like that. And this piece right here is a, what we call encaustic tile. It was invented in England and it's a process where the color is all the way through, no glazing on the top, it's just a natural surface and it really is an interesting. You may have seen it in your bathroom in the little six-sided square or you may have seen it in the little eight-sided pieces. That's encaustic tile, no glazing on the top. Now, something else that I really, really like about this showroom is over here in the corner, we see four different things that I think show different periods. Now, you could go with a colonial revival, kind of a revival motif with a fireplace here, or get a little bit funky and you have glass inlaid moons and suns and that piece. And then this green one that you're seeing has oak leaves and acorns in it and then a wildlife motif running through the middle. That's very arts and crafts, 1900 to 1930 era. Very nice, I like that. And then some more traditional things that you see here. Lots of choices in tile, and it's a great surface for your house. Man, this house is hot, but I found a place where they'll never find it. Otis! Otis is my cameraman. Otis, you never give me a break. I'm just trying to rest here. Well, I'm really kind of close enough to the floor. Let's talk about tile for a minute. You know, tile floors are great, and this is encaustic tile. Remember we were talking about that in the showroom? 
It's a beautiful design, aesthetically pleasing, but you know what? It's very, very durable as well. Now remember, when we talked about it before, we talked about how the color is all the way through. So if you wear it down a little bit, you don't see white underneath. It's the same color all the way through, so it's real durable. You can see these two pieces. They came out of the bathroom next door when they tore it out, but the carpenter saved them, which is like a miracle. Thank goodness he did that. Now let me show you this piece. This is a piece of ceramic glazed wall tile. And look at the hunk of concrete that baby is set into. It's phenomenal. Well, the floor is set into that as well, and it takes some really beefy framing to hold that up. Now, when we put tile down today, we don't need that kind of beefy framing. First of all, our tile's not as heavy, but also we've developed some new systems like cement board, and we're going to show that to you here in a little bit. Just remember, tile goes back to way before grease. People have been using it for patios and sidewalks and kitchens, and I especially like it for bathrooms. Now, when you're laying tile, it's important to have a good base to lay the tile on. Now, what these guys are doing is they're putting down what's called a thin set mortar over the old floor because it was really kind of uneven. And what'll happen once they get this all laid and troweled, and that's a V-trowel right there, and it's putting these little grooves in so that the cement board that they're putting on will sit down on it nice and tight, and it'll be real smooth. Now, it's real important to use cement board when you're laying tile on floor, and I even use it on walls because it gives a good, solid base. Now, they've cut it all out to fit around the original tub and the toilet and all the different parts of the floor and getting it all laid down nice and tight. You see how they've cut that all in advance so that it works real well. Now, the next step, of course, is to attach it. Now, they're nailing it down with a power nailer, and it's really going to hold well, especially with that thin set mortar underneath. And that's important because if you don't have a good base, the tile won't work. Now, the tile's been laid. It's also laid with a thin set mortar, and then it's grouted. It turns out real nice, but remember, do it on a good base. Another fun and like really durable flooring material are these rubber squares. Now it looks like something on the factory floor, but in fact it works great in rec rooms down in basements and in laundry rooms because it's very durable and it will keep water from getting down. And here's a hunk of it that was left over from this job. And you can see how thick this stuff is. It's just like pure rubber. And it wears like iron. Now to lay this down is not that tough. The squares come pretty good sized, 19, a little over 19 and a half, so they're really big squares. And you lay it down on a Luon plywood that has some mahogany veneer plywood because it's real smooth. You can't lay it on an old nasty floor. You've got to put this plywood down first and you nail it or screw it, and you have to fill the nail holes and everything. But then you use a regular mastic that comes with this stuff. It's a glue, and you spread it out, and you lay these down. It goes down nice and easy, and it's real durable stuff. Another option for this type of flooring are vinyl tiles. They get laid the same way as the rubber, and they come in all kinds of historic colors and styles, just like the old linoleum squares. Kitchens, bathrooms, and even laundries, the most popular flooring material today in America is sheet vinyl. Now, we used to call it linoleum, but now we call it sheet vinyl. Now, you look at all these different variations of colors and patterns, they're phenomenal and it's great, but the most important thing is quality. Now, this piece of vinyl right here has a layer of vinyl rolled onto it, very thin with a clear coat to make it a little tougher, but it's not nearly as tough as this inlaid vinyl. Almost half the thickness of this is vinyl on top of the backing. And that's the critical thing. On the wear side or where you walk, the more vinyl there is, the better quality the product is. Now you're going to be looking at $20 to $50 a square yard to have it installed. All you have to remember is the more vinyl on top, the better the quality. Sheet vinyl flooring is a great substance for bathroom floors and kitchen floors. And we're in a kitchen right now. And he was just stapling down what we call the underlayment. Now, you can see here, here are the little staple marks down here on the floor. They're really small, and the seams here are really tight. That's important. This little staple right here is what he's using, and it's coated. 
and it goes down into the subfloor below, which is the flooring material below what we call the underlayment here, and it really, really holds in tight, and that's important. Now here's a piece of that, this underlayment. You can see it's three ply, it's quarter inch thick, it's good and sturdy, it makes a great surface to put this down. It's just like any other home improvement, preparation is everything. And now over here, the seams are being filled, and all the staple holes are being filled so that when we get done the, the prep part and the vinyl's ready to go down, it'll have a perfectly smooth surface over the entire area of the underlayment and there won't be any seams showing. Well, as the preparation continues on, they'll finish up all these seams. Now, he's really good with this trowel and he's getting it all the seams filled in and all the staple holes but he's taking the edge of the trowel when it's dry and knocking all the goobers off so that they don't have to sand it and make a big mess. And that's important. And once they get it all done, it's nice and smooth, the next step is to bring the vinyl in. And that's what they're doing right here. Now they're going to dry fit the vinyl first. That's a very important thing to remember. Now remember, this is also what we call a total glue down, complete glue down. It's not a perimeter glue. We don't use those anymore because we found out that they stretch and they get weird, so we want glue on the entire floor. But they have to fit it first, and they roll it out over the entire area. And they have to be kind of careful because you can mess up the goods by bending it in the wrong way. So they're being careful to get it right up there against the cabinets. Now, the next step is to take a knife and to cut along the corners and along the baseboards and all the different places where it has to fit in. It's very important to be precise about this if you're having somebody install it. Now this guy has a really good hand and a really good eye and that's something that you don't know about so you want to go look at other jobs people have done or had done by these folks because if they don't know what they're doing they're going to mess up your floor. Now he's laying down the mastic, that's the glue, he's troweling that on and he's just lifted the vinyl back a little bit so that they can put it in one area. And as soon as he gets done with that they're laying it down into the area that he just put the glue on and then they get it kind of stretched out and put into place and that's real important so that you don't have any like bumps or ridges and that type of thing. Then they take a roller after it's all glued down and roll it out. Now this is really important because it makes the vinyl lay nice and flat and adhere to the glue well. This turned out great. I'm not surprised because the guys that prepped it knew what they were doing. That's absolutely key to any good vinyl job. They knew what they were doing. The prep was good. The quality of the product is good. There's absolutely no gaps around the edges anywhere in here. It looks great and preparation is the key to any good vinyl job. Of all the floor covering materials in America today, the most popular is wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. And we're in a carpet showroom right here, lots of different varieties of colors and patterns, and there's also a lot of varieties in quality. Now, right here, we have two different carpets, both nylon, both earth tones, but a very big difference. When I peel this back, this is so tightly woven, you cannot hardly see the backing. That's very important, because carpets are rated by their weight. The more weight there is per square foot or square inch, the better the carpeting. Now, when I peel this one back, you can definitely see the backing. That's the difference between quality and not as high quality. Now, right here is wool. Now, wool is the old standby. It's been around forever since the Persians started making oriental rugs. Wears like iron, a little more expensive, and they also can't dye it in a lot of different colors, so you get the earth tones, the oatmeals, and those kinds of things. Around over here, we have what's called olefin. Now, I'm going to compare olefin to nylon. Nylon is a byproduct of a refined oil like gasoline. If gasoline prices go up, so does the price of nylon carpeting. This is called olefin. It's mostly olefin, and the little specks of color you get here are from nylon that's been dyed that's added into it. Now, olefin will not take a dye, so you'll always get a basic earth tone color. Remember that, because if you're going to put carpeting down into the basement of a rec room where the kids are spilling stuff, not only will the olefin not take the dye in the factory, it won't take the dyes when you're spilling stuff on it in the basement. Now around over here, we have some really neat carpetings. If you live in an old historic house, you might want to consider some of these pattern carpets. They're very nice as well. Now carpeting is going to run about $18 a square yard installed, all the way up to $30. That's a good range for a quality carpet. If you remember that, you'll be in great shape. 
In the carpet industry, this mean looking thing is called an idiot stick. No, it's not. It's called a knee kicker. It's a stretching device to stretch the carpet. The problem is it's really only to be used to get things started. If your carpet layer shows up at your house and this is all they're going to use, you've got a serious problem on your hands. They need to be using a power stretcher and we'll show you that in a minute. Now down here we have the pad and this is a foam rubber pad. It's very dense, 3 eighths of an inch thick and this is the carpet tack strip. All these mean looking nails, that's what holds the carpet and they stretch it over that to keep it nice and tight. Now I'm going to give this thing back to you because I don't think I need it anymore. Why don't you come on here, I'll give it over here, there you go. I'm just going to step back and let you guys go to it. If wall-to-wall -wall carpeting isn't your bag and you have hardwood floors, well, area rugs are really your next choice, and I like oriental rugs. And we're in an oriental rug showroom right now, and this is Naeem, he's the owner. And he's uh, showing me all this beautiful stuff. Look at this one. I, uh, this one caught my eye the second I walked in the store, and it is absolutely exquisite. Uh, tell me a little bit about where this came from. Yes, this is a Persian Tabriz, uh, and the Tabriz is the area where it was made, and they're known for making some of the finest rugs in the world. Persian Tabriz. Yes. Oh, that's, that's great. So that's where it comes from, and it is exquisite, and it's $14,000. That's an exquisite price. But that doesn't mean that you can't afford an oriental rug. And what I want to do is go show you a couple of examples. Come on over and let's take a peek at this. There is a lot of variety in pricing and in quality in an oriental rug store. Now, this is a really beautiful rug. I like the colors and the patterns. It's very tight, the weaves. And what Naeem explained to me was that you need to turn the rug over and look at the actual detail on the back and look how tight it is as well. That's a sign of real high quality. Another part of that is the thickness of the rug. The thinner it is, the better quality it will be. And this is pretty thin, so this is a high quality rug. And this one runs around $6,000. Now over here, we have another rug, which is really beautiful too. But notice the definition on the back. It's not as tight as the rug that we just looked at, nor is the definition on the top. Now, if, the th if you look at the thickness here, you can see that it's much thicker. It's not as high a quality rug, but I think, Naeem, you said this one was going to get, what, how many years out of this 75 one? years. That's about. an average of 75, yeah. depending on use, of right. course. And the other rug over here was going to be about, what, 100. about 100 plus yeah. years. So there's a difference in quality, but there's also a big difference in price. And that's something that you want to consider. If you have a lot of money and you want to spend it on really quality rugs that are going to last a long time, that's great. But sometimes the lesser money, you get a good rug as well. Well, it's time once again for Ask Bob. That's where I answer your letters. Now, remember, early on this season, we decided we'd take the best questions from all the letters and answer them. Since we're talking about floors, wood carpeting is the biggest question I get. I call this wood flooring wood carpeting because it's very thin, about 3 eighths of an inch before it's sanded. Now, the big problem that everybody has, and the question is, how do I deal with it, is when they sand it, it gets very thin down here, and what ends up happening is that the tongues start showing and the grooves start disappearing. You can even see where this little piece is flapping up. Now, around 1900, the salesmen out there in the country, as prevalent as the tin man today, were out there selling this stuff, and it was going over a wide pine. It's good stuff, but you've got to be careful. Well, I wanted to end today's program about floors on a wildly geometric parquet floor, really historic. And man, did I find one in this house. This is the Palmer Mansion, built in 1874. And it's on the campus of Palmer Chiropractic College in Davenport, Iowa. And they're celebrating their 100th anniversary, which is kind of fun. We're glad to be here for that. Now, this is an interesting story. D.D. Palmer was the guy that literally discovered chiropractic and he promoted it worldwide. Now, his son, B.J., and his wife, Mabel, lived in this house and he also promoted it worldwide. Now, not everybody can have fancy parquet floor in their house, but you have a lot of choices out there and I hope we've given you some today. Thanks for spending some time with me. Listen, until next time, I'm Bob Yap about your house.
About Your House with Bob Yap was partially underwritten by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. In past places and future spaces, from main streets to back roads, we're helping Americans bring preservation home. The National Trust for Historic Preservation. <laughs> 